Welcome, everybody, to your free gym at Power Power. It is July 10th, 2023, but if you are watching on YouTube, it's probably a totally different day. Welcome from the past to the future. Uh, my name is Reed. I will be your tour guide through the wonderful world of the GMAT. Um, if you are looking for other free prep options, please know we have them. You can attend the first class of ours for free, no questions asked. Uh, that's a great thing to attend. We talk about some major GMAT strategies, particularly for data sufficiency. But we often also talk about just general GMAT prep strategies, how the test works, how to study for it. We give you a lot of good information in that first class. So you can try that out for free, no questions asked. You can also do a similar thing with our Interact program. You can try the first part of that self-study program and video course for free. Uh, we also have free Foundations of Math workshops running uh, two to four times a month right now. We have two five-hour Foundations of Math workshops, one on variables and one on computation. Um, the rough distinction between those is that computation will help you deal with actually calculating and crunching numbers quickly and efficiently. And uh, the variables workshop will deal more with like algebra and word problem translations. So we, we try to cover both, uh, cover, cover all the foundation bases in those two sessions. You do not need to attend them in any order. They work independently. They're in communication with each other, but you don't need to worry about which one you do first. Um, and of course, we have our free GMAT prep hours like this one you're watching here. We have a whole library of these on YouTube. Uh, at this point, honestly, you could make a full GMAT course syllabus from those videos. Uh, pretty much everything that needs to be said about the GMAT has been said in those videos to the point where I have a hard time coming up with things to talk about in these now. I'm getting really into more uh, more and more into the weeds or more and more I feel like it's kind of a rehash of videos we've done before. So at this point, we have a whole resource library available to you free of charge. So check those out if you're doing some GMAT studying on your own. Uh, you can get a lot of good tips from Great Manhattan Prep Instructors in that library on YouTube. Uh, today's lesson, we are going to talk about set building, quant questions that make us build and deal with and understand sets of numbers. Now, as I just told you, I often feel like when I come up with a topic, it's something that's you know either in the weeds or something we've talked about before. And this is definitely in that realm. This has been uh, a topic that has appeared in these three free prep hours in some way. Uh, the advanced statistics most recently with WIT, but my free GMAT prep hour on statistics, just about averages, medians, and sets of numbers. Uh, and some similar topics will appear in the weighted average lesson. Uh, so there, this stuff today won't be brand spanking, spanking new, but it will be, I think, a useful deep dive into this very specific question type. We do talk about it on, the, or I know specifically, I talk about it in that averages, medians, and sets of numbers video, but it is a pretty common statistic question type. And I figured it was actually worth kind of a deeper dive, giving a full hour of this kind of question and making sure we're clear on how to handle it, what strategies are available to us, what things to look out for on the GMAT, what traps and tricks they have up their sleeve, and uh, what you need to be doing and thinking about when you deal with a question about sets of numbers. So that is the plan for today. And let's go ahead. We're just going to jump right into this with a warm up question here. Go ahead and take two minutes, which is the average time you have for a GMAT problem on the actual test. Take two minutes here and take a stab at this question from official GMAT prep materials.
All right, that is two minutes. So go ahead and make a final guess if you're here in the chat. If you're at home watching the recording, if you want to pause and think for another minute or so, you can. But in general, you don't want to let yourself go too long without choosing a letter. Uh, you want to be in the habit of choosing a letter. And then if you want to work untimed for as long as you want, that's fine. But get used to choosing letters even when you're not sure because it's guaranteed the test is going to make you do such a thing. Uh, so final guess is here. And let's talk about how uh, an expert might handle this question. We have a general process at Manhattan Prep we call understand, plan, solve. That's how we move through questions. Uh, you want to avoid just diving in and thoughtlessly writing stuff. We want to kind of have a process, a systematic uh, approach to problem solving questions that we're moving through every time here. Um, so on the understand phase, I'm looking at the question, I'm looking at the answers, and I'm curious about what's available to me. I'm trying to maybe categorize, notice uh, what kind of question it is, what topics it seems to be dealing with. And so I'm, I'm immediately seeing three boxes with an average weight. And so I, that immediately puts me in the world of averages. And I also notice that three is not that many numbers. And in set building questions, the question type of today, typically, typically, and we'll see some exceptions to this, but set building questions do not have big numbers in them. They give you a small amount of numbers you can visualize. And so if I'm dealing with three numbers and an average, I'm pretty quick to use uh, what we sometimes call the, the um, blank slot. That's not the exact name. I'm drawing a blank. I'm drawing a blank right now. But the, the, uh, the blank slot approach where we lay out the blanks for the numbers we know we're dealing with. We have three of them. So we have three numbers here. We know there's an average in these three of seven. And if I'm good at averages, I know that that means sum over number equals average. I can figure out pretty quickly that with three numbers and an average of seven, I meant to put average here for this number for this here. Uh, with an average of seven, I can figure out pretty quickly that the sum of these three numbers is 21. And just a little diversion here that I wasn't planning on doing, but it's on my mind lately. I, uh, one thing I've started to think about in my teaching, I started to call certain things synonyms, even though they're not, even though that's not how we usually think of the word, right? A synonym is two words that mean the same thing. But um, you can do that with sentences as well. So the average of three numbers is seven. That's that's a synonym. That means the exact same thing as the sum of three numbers is 21. And being able to move through synonyms on this test is a, is a useful thing to look out for. Um, anyway, here, so we have average of seven, sum of 21. We also know that there's a median of nine and the median is the middle number in a set of numbers uh, if it's an odd set. If it's an even set of numbers, I need to take the middle of the two in the middle. But I will say that in most set building questions, there's going to be an odd number of numbers because they like to make it so it's a nice clean, here's the number in the middle. And sure enough, that's what they did here. There's three numbers, the median is nine. I want the maximum possible weight of this slot the light, lightest, oh, excuse me, no, reread the question, read, the lightest box. I want the maximum possible weight of this box. And by the way, when I do the blank slot approach, I am generally, and then I almost want to say always, thinking that this is in order, right? Smallest, medium, largest. Okay, and then I have my answer choices. One, two, three, four, five. Pretty simple answers, nice clean integers. Honestly, there's no reason I can't just start plugging these in and seeing what happens. And I actually think that's what I would do. You know, I would actually just start plugging in and seeing like, okay, let's just see if, can we make this five? Can we do five and nine? Well, if I think about this number being five and this number being nine and the sum being 21, this number would need to be seven. So I'd have five, nine, and seven. Seems like it'd be fine, except... If I have these three numbers, seven is actually now the median. Nine is no longer the median. I have broken a constraint and I'm not allowed to do that. So five would go away. 
I saw some answers of four in the chat. We're going to see a similar issue. If I try to do four here, four, nine, this would be eight, but that has the same problem. Eight would bump into the median and become nine. One thing about sets, set questions and set building, rules, uh, 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 maybe not rules, but yeah, rules or strategies of set building. The median is a stop sign. That median is fixed. You can't cross it. It gives you a nice firm post in the middle that must be respected, must be stuck to. So these numbers that are trying to jump the median can't do that, right? The largest number must be to the right of the median. Um, so four is out. So then if I do three, three, I think is going to work. So we have three, nine, and nine. And that is allowed. You can have a duplicate here. It does not say anywhere that these boxes have different weights. And this is actually something we're going to deal with and think about today when this problem tells us this and not. I'm kind of spoiling the surprise here, I guess. But uh, this, this does come up. And it is worth noting that, hey, you know what? This can be equal to the median, but it cannot cross the median. And that is true of anything on this side of nine. Conversely, this side could not cross the median going up to nine. Now you will find, since three is already the max, we're not even gonna get close to nine in this case. But if for instance, the sum was not 21, if the sum was a hundred, then we could go all the way up to nine for that smallest number, but not beyond because the median is a stop sign. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So I kind of, I, I flew through the understand plan solve there, but Notice after the understand such situation where I kind of diagnosed the topic, I had the setup of the blank slots. Um, the plan phase was the, okay, what can I do with my situation? And I decided to just plug in my answers for the smallest number and see which one worked. You know, start at the biggest, because if the biggest works, you're done. And then it didn't. So work down to three, three works. There you go. That's the max. Okay. So understand plan. I was plugging the answers and see what we get and then solve, actually do it. We do it. Three works. That's it. Maximizing and minimizing numbers uh, in sets is not an uncommon thing to deal with, as we will see. We'll see other, other questions like this. Okay. And what we're going to find here, if we think about this, Let's just start with that set we just had, three, nine, and nine. And we know that I can't make this number any bigger. Um, and so that is the maximum of this number, right? Uh, if I were to make it smaller, if I were to make it, for instance, two, and the sum was still 21, notice that I got to, if I took one away from the three, I need to add it to this nine, because this other nine, the middle nine, is fixed. That's the median. But if I subtract one here, I have to balance that out here. If I take another one out and I take one, I have to give it to the 10 again. I have to add one again and get 11. To keep the sum balanced, anything that gets taken away must get added. That's another, uh, another thing to look out for in set building, set building rule slash strategy. With a fixed average, Anything taken away must be put back somewhere else. Anything added must be taken from somewhere else. The set must rebalance. In fact, if you watch the pre gym prep hour I made on averages, I talk a lot about the average as a balance. And so you can think about that when you're dealing with a set. And so what that means is if you're asked to maximize one number in a set, if I'm asked to maximize this number, what that really means, since I can't max out the nine, is I'm also going to minimize this number. Because if I'm going to make this number as big as possible and I can't change this number, then everything is getting taken from this number. And that's another way you could solve this problem is to think about that, to think, okay, I need to make this number as big as possible. What's the smallest possible value of this? Well, nine. 
because I can't cross nine or I break the median, in which case, if the sum is 21, this is going to be three. Okay. So that gets out some, honestly, some pretty big principles that we're going to see as we move through today. Um, and these two ideas of like keep the middle, the middle, it's fixed and then balance, right? Take something away, has to add it. Add something, you got to take it away. That is a pretty constant game in set building questions. The next question we're going to do is a data sufficiency question. For those of you that have done some studying on this test, you've probably seen these, you're familiar with these. Um, if you haven't, this is a really quick crash course, so it's going to go pretty quickly. Uh, if you're watching the recording, I would pause and do some research on data sufficiency first and make sure you're clear on how this question type works. It's a very weird GMAT specific question type. Uh, basic idea is that you're not necessarily trying to answer this question that was asked. In this case, how many of the employees are senior managers? I'm not really trying to answer that question. What I'm trying to answer is where in these two statements is there enough information to answer the question that is asked? So it's less about what is the answer and it's more about where is there enough information to answer? And the five answer choices are always the same. They're always in this order. The way we remember these is 12, 10, 1, 2, T, E, N. That stands for statement one alone, statement two alone. The two statements together, let me move this a little bit, together, each on its own, and then not enough is the last. Okay. Uh, and so that covers all the different possibilities in the uh, in combining the two statements. So for instance, in this question, the answer would be C, because if I want to know how many are senior managers, it's not enough to know that 80% were senior managers because 80% of what number? So statement one is not sufficient. Uh, statement two tells me 64 were not senior managers, but how many were? That's not sufficient. But if I take these two together, if I know that 80% were, that means 20% weren't, are not senior managers. Well, and then 20% of the total equals those 64 people who are not senior managers, I can solve for the total. So the answer here would be C. That's a very quick crash course. If you don't fully understand that and you're here today, I understand. Sorry that this is gonna be a little bit of a, these kinds of questions are gonna be, they're gonna have an added complexity. Uh, but I would encourage you to get caught up on data efficiency as soon as possible. It's obviously a, a, one of the biggest things to go down on this test and one of the things people are least familiar with when they come into the process. So this is a data sufficiency question. Remember the answer choices, one alone, two alone, not, uh, together, each alone, and then not enough. Take two minutes and give this question a swing.
that is two minutes. If you haven't chosen a letter, go ahead and put in a final guess. Don't be afraid of being wrong. The way the GMAT works, it's going to make you be wrong. That's part of the fun of the test. It's expected that you're going to be wrong a lot, even if you get really good at it. That's actually why I like the test. I know it kind of sucks at first. It feels awful. But once you kind of ad adopt this mindset, they're like, I'll miss some and it's fine. It's a good place to be. So come with the final guess. And here's what I want you to do first. Before we talk about this question, I'm going to have you, I'm just going to put this across your heart and, you know, hope to die. Let's promise that you're going to play along for a second. I want you to close your eyes. If you're watching the recording, close your eyes. Don't look at the screen. All right. Now open them. Give this question a minute of thought. Because I did change something. Let's take a minute and see if you can figure out what I changed and if it affects the answer at all. All right, that is a minute. So uh, let's actually, let's just deal with this one first. This, uh, how do I want to do this? Yeah, let's do this one first. Why not? So uh, again, understand, plan, solve. I'm looking at this thing. I'm seeing again, an average five numbers. That's not very many. I'm thinking again, we're probably going to do the, the uh, blank slot method here for the statements. Um, I want to know if the average is at least 30. So is the average greater than or equal to 30? So that's, uh, there's five numbers. They're all positive. I noticed that five positive integers. I want to note such things. I always write down your givens. I use, I write posint to stand for positive integers. I don't know if the average is greater than 30. I could do a little quick rephrase here and recognize that that's also asking, is the sum of these five numbers greater than 150? These are the question, I want to make sure. So if the sum is greater than 150, the average is greater than 30 for five numbers. And again, that's just because sum over five, you know, is the sum over the five numbers, is it greater than or equal to 30? That's the question. Is the average greater than 30? Statement one tells me that each integer is a multiple of 10. So I'd write something like all multiples of 10. And at this point, I'm doing what's called testing cases. It's a very common data efficiency uh, question strategy. We have many videos on it. It's one of the biggest things on the test to get good at. But basically, you're just considering what is possible under this constraint. If all of these numbers are a multiple of 10, I want to think about a situation that makes that true. And honestly, you don't have to get fancy with it. In fact, I'm not going to. I'm just going to say every number is 10. And you might be like, can you do that? Can they all be the same? There's nothing in this question that says they're different. Hint, hint, spoiler, spoiler. There's no reason I can't make all these numbers 10. And then here, is the average greater than 30? No. The average equals 10, which is less than 30. But I could also make all of the numbers 40. And here that is greater than 30. The average is greater than 30. And so I've shown that in this statement, there's two different possible answers. The average could be less than 30 and the average could be more than 30 with all the numbers being a multiple of 10. And so I know that it's not statement one alone and it's not statement 
one and two alone because statement one is not sufficient. So statement one is out as is answer choice D, each alone. Statement two tells me the sum is 160, which, well, okay, remember the rephrase was that is the sum greater than 150, greater than or equal to 150. If it's 160, then it, yes, the, the average is more than 30 because the sum is greater than 150. And so statement two would be sufficient. The answer to this version of the question would be B. Now, what was different about the other question was that this original question had the word different. That was the difference. And this is, and just to emphasize something I hinted at earlier, it is important to note in a question, in a set building question, if the question, if the numbers can be the same or if they must be different. And they will tell you different. If they don't say that, you can consider that they are all the same. If they don't tell you explicitly, the numbers must be different. Um, or I guess they could say something like, you know, consecutive integers, a set of consecutive integers. That means it's sets like two, three, four, five, six, right? They can't be the same because they are consecutive. A set of consecutive multiples of three, three, six, nine, 12, 15. But any set that doesn't give you this criteria, it's you're allowed to make them the same, but not here. Here we are told different, and I would put that in my givens during my understand phase up front. Different numbers are allowed. And so now I go to statement one with a new constraint. Now I'm told that these are different numbers. And so, okay, I understand that I need to build a set of multiples of 10, and I'll just plan. Let's test some cases like I did before. But now, now everything's going to be a different number. So I could do 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Well, okay, in this situation, the average is 30. And I don't need to use my average formula here. This is a special kind of set that you want to keep your eye out for. This is an evenly spaced set. In such a set, the median, the middle number equals the average. So is the average greater than or equal to 30? Yes. In this case, yes, because 30 is greater than or equal to 30. If I make the 40 or the 50 any bigger, that will just make the average bigger. I just pulls the average up. And so that would still be yes. And so now the thing I'm trying to do is get a situation where the average is less than 30. And... If they're all multiples of 10, I'm going to find pretty quickly that's going to be hard to do. If they're all different positive multiples of 10, this is not going to be easy to do. It will be impossible to do. If I try to, okay, let's, you know, 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, because 0 is technically a multiple of 10, but it's not positive, and we have positive integers. So I have to throw that case out. It doesn't follow the rules. Any other case that follows the rules will have a median of at least 30 or an average of at least 30. And so this is now sufficient. And it's because of that distinction, different positive integers. They must be different. And so now statement two is still sufficient because it still tells me the sum is greater than 150. So in this version of the question, the answer is D. Each statement alone is sufficient. So just big strategy, big awareness. Notice if a question specifies different numbers or not. That's it. All right, moving on up. Moving on up. Let's do... Yeah, let's do this question. Why not? I like this question. 
It's a little bit different from the other ones today, but it is worth looking at here. Take two minutes. That is two minutes. Final guesses. I like this question. It just feels, for some reason, it just feels like the GMAT. So, so much about the GMAT is, is not about crunching numbers and doing a bunch of arithmetic or algebra, even though some skills are obviously useful, but that's not really the point. Uh, it, it uses math to test other reasoning skills. And one thing it really tests is certain mathematic moves that feel intuitive but aren't or, or sorry that feel intuitive but aren't correct uh they they might be intuitive but they don't yield right answers here so i have here 12 consecutive integers and so that again a consecutive integers means in sequence and negative four is the least integer on that list so I'm, again, I'm in the understand phase. I'm noticing what's going on here. So I have a set, 12 numbers, not that many. Negative four is the least number. I want the range of, not the list, of the positive integers in the list. So I know my smallest number is negative four. I know I have consecutive integers, so I have negative three, negative two, negative one, yada, yada. But I want the range, meaning the largest minus the smallest in a set, but not of the whole set, of the set of positive numbers in the set. Fine, that's no problem. I just need to figure out what the, where does this set end? And here's the fun little trap on this one. It's kind of intuitive to say, okay, negative four is the smallest. There's 12 numbers. Let's do negative four plus 12. That's eight. And so then I have the numbers one through eight. So the range is seven, right? Eight minus one is seven. That will be the range of the positive numbers in this list. This is wrong. This is wrong, 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 wrong. That is the trap answer. Don't step into that. And this is a good example of where more care, even if it seems kind of silly, will be beneficial. If we actually write out the set, the 12, the 12 slots, and we you know, write out the numbers, negative four, negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. By the way, this would not take that long. You have two minutes to do this. You can write these 12 numbers in two minutes. You can write these in 40 seconds and you'll avoid the mistake. And that's worth the time, right? Yeah, this is faster and it's also incorrect. So if you need to be a little more careful and do a little bit more writing, go, please do. <laughs> you know, it's worth the points if it's going to save you a silly mistake. The biggest number in this list is actually seven. And so the range is actually seven minus one, which is six.
why can't I just add 12? Well, because 12 is the number of numbers in the list. And let's think about a, a simpler list of numbers. Let's think about like one, two, and three. In order to get to three, I don't add from one. In order to get to three, I don't add three, I add two. In order to get to four, I don't add four, I add three. Because what does this two represent from one to three? Well, it represents the jump of one and then another jump of one. And then to get to four, it's another jump of one. And so to have a range of three, to have three jumps of one, notice you need four numbers. The range tells you the distance between the first and the last. But in order to have that range, you need the starting point. So 12 is not the distance from the first to the last. It's the uh, number of numbers in the list. 12 numbers have 11 jumps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11 jumps. There's always one more number than there are jumps. And so big GMAT set tip, don't mistake the range for the number of numbers. They are related, but they are different. There's a formula for this the range of a set divided by the spacing in the set plus one gives you the number of numbers. And by spacing, I mean whatever you're counting by. So if it's just consecutive integers, you're counting by one. And the range is just the last minus the first. Alex, if the test wanted the number of numbers, they might give you the range, perhaps. I, I'm not sure. You know, they might say, okay, negative four is the smallest number. There's 11. Uh, the range is 11. How many numbers are in the set? They could ask that. It would get especially tricky if it's like, you know, a set of the multiples of three from 50 to 100. How many, how many numbers in that set are, you know, 50 to 100, you probably count, but it's like, what if it's 50 to 450, right? How many multiples of three are there in that range of numbers? You'd have to use something like this to figure that out without counting up every one, you don't have time for that. Okay, so don't mistake the range of a set for the number of numbers in the set. That's my advice there. Um, all right, let's keep plugging forward here. Let's try. Yeah, let's try this one here. Take two minutes for another official question.
two minutes there. Final guesses. So in the understand phase, I'm again, I'm reading, okay, I got 15 integers. That's quite a bit, but again, this took about 30 seconds for me to do. I was looking at the clock and that was using a mouse and I was going slow. You know, you can, you can get out the 15 slots fast enough. So I have 15 different numbers. Again, I have a median and this is a little bit strange. I know we just had a question about range, but usually in set questions, I'm dealing with median and averages. It's a little bit unusual to have to deal with a range, but okay. I have the median is 25. So that's the middle number. So that'll be the eighth on this list of 15. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight is 25. And I know the range is uh, also 25. So I know that this number to this number the smallest to the largest is 25. So I can have X for the smallest and X plus 25 for the largest. I want the greatest possible integer and, and it does say integers and I also note different. Everything has to be a different number here and I want the maximum possible number. So I want to maximize this. Now, you might remember earlier I said if I'm going to maximize one number, I'm going to have to minimize other numbers. I'm immediately putting my foot in my mouth because that is true when the average is fixed. When the sum of the numbers is fixed, if I'm making one number bigger, another number has to be smaller. But this question does not fix the average. So I don't have to worry about that aspect of the set in this way. I just want to make this number as big as possible. Well, I mean... Since that is 25 more, I want to make this number as big as possible, too. If I make X as big as possible, I make the biggest number as big as possible because that gives me the plus 25 for that maximum number. And again, the key here is that these must be different. If I take out the different, which I do in this version, right, then I could just make all of these 25 because remember, you can't pass the median. It's a stopping point. And then the max could be 50, right? If you chose 50, it's because you didn't consider the fact that in the original question, these have to be different numbers. So I can't make all of these 25. That's the trap answer for people who do. <clears throat> so how do I make this number as big as possible? Well, I kind of just consider that each number here We also make as big as possible, and that just means we count down. And we get to 18. 18 is the biggest number that could be this, the biggest, smallest number of this set to have a median of 25, where every number is a different integer. And then what's the max? 18 plus 25, 43. That's it. Isn't the median odd? Mandy, the median is odd. Why does that matter? The median of the set is odd, but there's also an odd number of numbers in the set. It's not, you don't worry whether the median itself is even or odd. The question is, is there an even or odd number of numbers in the set itself. If it's odd, the median is the middle number. If it's even, the median is the middle of the middle numbers. So for instance, in the set three, six, eight, 20, if that's my set of numbers, there's four numbers in that set. And so the median is actually the middle of six and eight. It would be seven, which notice is not actually even in the set, funny enough. So, but here 25 is the middle number. It's the middle of the 15 numbers. That makes 43 the largest possible with the range of 25. All right, onward and upward. 
again notice if it specifies different or not. Um, let's do. Do this question here. This is a good question. Another data sufficiency. Remember your answer choice is 1210. Take two minutes. That is two minutes, final guesses. If you want a little extra time and you're working at home, hit pause and keep working. Let's take a look at this one. So again, understand, plan, solve. I see that I have a set of numbers. First thing I'm gonna do is put them in order. Now, obviously I can't put them totally in order because what is X, right? Here's the big mystery. Where is X in this list? Not sure. It's put, here's an important thing. It's put first, but that doesn't mean it is the smallest. In fact, notice that this list is out of order. But even if it were in order otherwise, right? Even if technically it said, you know, X, one, three, eight, 12, if it gave you that, but it didn't specify that the list was in order from least to greatest, X could be, uh, you know, the X could be anywhere in this list. So make sure they, you know, don't assume that X is the smallest just because it's first or the biggest just because it's last. Make sure they tell you that the list is in order. Okay. And even if it looks like it is, since you don't know X, you're not really sure. But here it's definitely out of order. So X can definitely be anywhere. Uh, we want the median. And so, okay, five numbers. Important thing. Oh, sorry. Siren's driving by. Uh, we, I'm noticing here five numbers. So the median is one of the five. All right. And I want to know if it's greater than the average. That's the question. Is the median greater than the average? Well, what is the average? The average is going to be the sum over five, which is going to be three plus one plus 12 plus eight. That's going to be 24. And then I have to add that X over five numbers. Here's my average. That's what the average is going to be. I want to know if the median is greater than that. Now, there's still some exploring I think we should do up front. If you can, if you do, you know, if you have the chance to explore up front, it's almost always worth the time. And what I want to explore up front is like where X could be and what that would do for the median, because there's really not that many choices. And this is the key, right? If you recognize there aren't that many choices in this situation, let's lay out what those choices are, right? One choice is that three is the median. I said put in order, but I put 12 before eight. I promise I know that eight is greater than 12. OK. 
Okay. Um, three could be the median. And then X could be, you know, and then I have one and X here. And I don't know if X is greater than one or less than one. Notice all we know is that X is an integer. It's not, not necessarily positive. And it, while it's pretty unusual to deal with negative numbers in set questions, I do note it is possible for X to be negative here. So I don't know what this is, but I am curious. Okay, in this situation, the median is three. When would the average be great? Uh, uh, when would three be greater than the average? Looking at this right here, if X is any positive number, then this is gonna be, then, then, then three is going to be greater excuse me, then the average is going to be greater than three. So the only way for this situation to have an answer of no is for X to be negative, to pull that average down less than three. Otherwise, goodness, excuse me, in order for the answer to be yes, X has to be negative to pull that average less than three. Otherwise, the average is going to be greater than the median. The answer to this question is going to be no. Another possibility is that X is the medium. And I have one, three, X, eight, and 12. And in that case, you can actually say, okay, when is 24 plus X over five greater than X? When does that happen? Well, if I solve, if I do a little rearranging here, that'd be 25 is greater than 5x. I'm sorry, 24 plus x is greater than 5x, which would be 24 is greater than 4x, because I subtract x from both sides, which would be is 6 greater than x or is x less than 6? But notice that that's not enough. X has to be less than six and greater than three for this to work. Because if X is less than three, we're back in this situation. So in this situation, if X is between three and six, the answer is uh the answer is yes, the median will be greater than the average. Okay. The final scenario that is possible in this upfront work is that X is bigger than the median, which would be one, three, eight is now the median. And then I have X and 12 somewhere over here. So when would eight be greater than the average? Well, again, the, the average right now is 24 plus X over five. In order for eight to be bigger than that, X can't get to about 40, or sorry, the, the sum can't get to about 40. So long as X is less than 16, then eight will be larger. The median will be larger than the average. If X is more than 16, the average will be larger than the median. So the question here is, where is X related to 16? Is it less than 16 or more than 16? If it's less than 16, the median is larger. If it's more than 16, the average is larger. Now, perhaps you wouldn't do all the work I just did. It would go faster if I, you know, if I wasn't explaining every thought that I had, right? But to explain it takes a little longer than it would to do it. But even if you don't do everything I did, I think it's helpful to at least lay out the three scenarios, right? You might not do this. That part got a little wonky. You know, that's that's kind of the densest part of this, but it's like, okay, is X less than three? And three is the median. Is X more than eight? And eight is the median. Is X the median? Those are the three scenarios. And in that world, I got to think about, is the median larger than the average? Well, statement one tells me X is greater than six. And if I've already laid out these three worlds, and especially if I've had this last world where I've recognized the questions about where is it, you know, if it's less than 16 or if it's more than 16, I can do 
x equals 15. And then the median is greater than the average because eight will be greater than the average. Or I can say x is a million. And here the average is going to be greater than the median. And here's the thing, here's why prephrasing is nice. If you've prephrased well, if you've done some good work up front, a lot of times the statement work can be quick. Because by recognize, hey, X is greater than six, that puts me either, I could be here, but I could also be here. And this last one's the easier world to deal with. So let's just make X less than 16 in this world. And let's make X way bigger than 16 in this world. So we get different answers. And I'm gonna realize pretty quick when I go to statement two that we're in the same scenario, right? This tells me that X is greater than the median. Well, that's that third scenario. And everything I just did in that third scenario applies. X could be 15 or X could be 100. I can reuse the same cases and show that this statement is also not sufficient. And then when I bring them together, I've already done it. The two cases work for both statements. And so the answer here is E. There's not enough information to answer, is the median greater than the average? Because in this third world where, at, where eight is the median, the question is, where is X relative to 16? If X is less than 16, then the median is larger. If X is greater than 16, then the average is larger. And it, none of the statements tell me about X relative to 16. So both cases are possible in both situations with both rules. We don't have enough to answer this question. This arithmetic was probably not something I would actually do. Kind of got cut up in the moment for what it's worth. And that would save a lot of time here in, in the upfront organization. That's the most confusing part of what I did and like ignore it. Let's just pretend I didn't do it. It was bad. I would do that if I had to. I would recognize that, okay, I could do this, this algebra if I had to, if I, you know, if I am in the situation where X is the median, I see what I would do. Hopefully I don't have to do that. And I don't. I'm always, I can live in this third world every time. And that makes things nice and easy. All right. Closing up the hour here. I've taught the big things I want to teach. Let's just do a challenge problem or two. Yes, yeah, do this one. This is a good challenge question that we'll put to test some of the things we've discussed. Take two minutes for this official prep problem.
That is two minutes. All right, so <clears throat> certain city has 132,000 people divided into 11 districts. So first read, I'm not entirely sure where this is going yet. No districts have a population that is more than 10% greater than any other district. So I, I am noticing 11, you know, this population into this many districts. That's starting to feel averagey sum over number of districts, right? The 132,000 divided by 11 districts gets me the average number of people per district. But then they tell me that no district is to have a population more than 10% greater than any other district. So they have to be pretty closely matched. And I want to know the minimum population that the least populated district should have. So I'm dealing with this number and I'm trying to make it as small as possible. I'm trying to minimize the minimum. And if I'm trying to minimize the minimum and I have a fixed average, remember what that means. That means anything taken away here must be added somewhere else. And so if I'm trying to make this number as small as possible, I'm going to try to maximize everything else in the set. I want to keep taking away from this number and keep adding the people to the other districts as much as I can. A little bit of gerrymandering happening here is what it sounds like to me. But there's a limit. I can't just keep doing it. I can't get this district down to one. Because there's a, a limit here that no district can have more than 10% population of any other district. And so if I'm, you know, if this is as small as it can be, then the biggest possible range is a 10% increase from that number. So if I minimize this, I make this one as big as possible. But I'm also trying to make all the others as big as possible. Well, there's no median in this set. There's no median given. But it, it makes sense that I can't make any number less than the maximum more than the maximum. It seems like a pretty obvious truism, though it is worth stating and understanding, right? No number now can be more than 1.1x, but they can be 1.1x. I can make every number in this set 1.1x. Nothing here says the numbers have to be different. So what I have here is 10 districts of 1.1x. And then one district of x. And that's my number of people. Those are my people. So 10 times 1.1x is 11x plus x is 12x. That equals 132,000. So 12x equals 132,000, X is gonna be 132,000 divided by 12. Few ways of doing that, but ultimately you're gonna realize that this is 11,000. X is 11,000, that is the smallest possible number a district could have here. One thirty two divided by twelve is eleven. Okay. So again, with a fixed average, if I make one number smaller, if I take people out of that district, they gotta go into some other district. So I gotta make the others bigger. How big can I make them? Up to ten percent larger than X. Okay. 
thing. Tricky question, but hinges on the same ideas that we've talked about in that first question, right? The first question, go back to the beginning, right? It only had three numbers. It's easy to kind of see that seesaw. You make one bigger, you make the other larger. But that same principle applies to this question. Just that there's more districts, more slots to deal with. One last question, why not? We're here. I made it up today, so I want to use it. Take two minutes, and again, similar game. Think about what we've talked about in building sets. All right, two minutes. Similar game. What do I notice up front? I see that we've analyzed nine restaurants. We have average. It was 21. And we're told the median is 18. So this is a standard set building question. Here's my median. Again, the median is a stop sign. Average is 21. I could do 21. You know, this is the sum is 21 times nine. I'm not going to do that right now because I'm lazy. Uh, I know if I need to do it, I can. I might not need to do it. Let's find out. Um, the restaurant that had the least violations had half as many as the one that had the most. So here's the most. Here's the least. I could do one half X and X, but I think I'd rather do X and two X. I don't know. Fractions bum me out. Let's use X to be the smallest and then 2X to be the largest. And I want the smallest possible number of violations for the restaurant that had the most. So I actually want to make this number the smallest as possible. We want to minimize this one. Okay. Well, if I want to make this number as small as possible, if I'm taking away from this one, I'm going to be maximizing these. Except for this last one. I won't maximize that one because that's actually the bigger this one is, the bigger two X's. I actually want to minimize X as well. But if I'm maximizing, let's say these, well, first off, let's start with these three, right? What's the maximum they can be? Well, 18. They can't cross the median. The median is a stop sign. What's the maximum these can be? Well, two X, they can't beat the maximum. And so now I have my set and I want to figure out what X is. And then I'm going to make sure I solve for two X. You don't want to make this right. I'm, I might even write that here, that the thing I'm looking for right now is two X, not X. 
And so I add these up, I get, okay, X plus eight X is nine X plus, I have four 18s in this situation here. And that's gonna equal the sum 21 times nine. And I'm recognizing here that every number here is a multiple of nine. So let's just divide both sides by nine and get X plus this becomes four times two. So this becomes eight equals 21, X equals 13. Careful, careful, that's the trap A. The max, the the minimum for two x is twenty six. Okay, make sure you specify what the question is. That's it. Again, same idea. Same idea. Fixed median. Make some numbers smaller. Make some numbers bigger. You know, just deal with the constraints of your set. That is a crash course in set building. Again, a not uncommon question type. Um, deal with your constraints, consider the possible sets, range median, average and median most, and then range questions sneak in sometimes. Okay, if you're looking for the free prep hours, remember they are out there. We hope to see you there. Uh, we hope to see you at any other Manhattan prep events. I'll stick around now for any questions from the group that is here. If you're in YouTube land, best of luck in your studies. Hope to see you soon. Have a wonderful day or night.